Oh, I'm gonna go mobile. You're all getting. You're all getting in this. this I mean, a, if you want. <laughs> Four person steady cam. Yeah. All right, live. Oh, I can't see the screen. Live from the Atacama <laughs> Desert. Don't curse, don't curse. Hang out on air. Ow. Alma live. Boom. When I see the viewer count go up, then I'll start worrying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we need the UT link too. That would help. Or here. Or here. YouTube link. I think people like <clears throat> you can get it on iDevices. I've got my good headphones. You want me to put those on? Or do you want them to monitor the audio? Um. Yeah. yeah let's at least test it. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. All right. Like I said, we still have a few minutes because this is completely unscheduled. <laughs> let's see. Cosmo Quest can probably be tweeted. I have my Hootsuite login. <sighs> Caught it in post. There you go. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know if I could hear my own audio. It's a good question. Right? I don't think I, I can. Don't think you can. I don't know. Yeah. You're right. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we right. just use it to minimize echo, pretty mm -hmm. much. All right. Oh, good. We got to retweet. Uh, I could totally take over Pamela's account and retweet it from hers. I love you, I Pamela. Should, I should tweet Emily. Okay. Yeah. See, she's all. Yeah. She's always about. Hi. If anyone's watching yet. Oh, we have four viewers. Hi. Uh, we are currently uh, putting together an unscheduled hangout, which means uh, we are madly tweeting, sharing on Google Plus. Uh, if you could do the same, that would help Hello. us out a lot. Hi. So if you, oh, how did I get into full screen and how do I make it go away? <laughs> <laughs> That's new. Well, we're out here on the frontier. Exactly. So. Except I don't know what I just did. <laughs> you think we're still live? Yeah, we're live. Okay. We have viewers now. <laughs> um, yeah, if you can tweet it, Emily, to get into maybe right Pamela now. as well, now that I just screwed up my screen. So I am Nicole Gallucci from CosmoQuest. Hello. Uh, I promised you all a scheduled hangout at 2 p.m. Chilean time. It is now past 3 our time. I don't know what time it is for the rest of the world. We're all a little discombobulated right here. We just got down from the high site of the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This is uh, one of the highest and driest sites in the world. Uh, I have with me Matt Kaplan. Hello, Nicole. Thank you for Society. inviting me in. Yeah, so we are, we are doing a CosmoQuest Planetary Society impromptu co-host today. As we eat lunch. <laughs> As we eat lunch because we have not had enough oxygen in our brains. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. I know, yeah. I know that word, but yeah, literally. <laughs> um, and um, it was spectacular. Yes. And you, I mean, I was thrilled, but you were a radio astronomer on fire. Yeah. I was pretty happy. I, mean, I, I went very high. I went high frequency. It was. <laughs> I have some great video, which unfortunately won't be able to show. Of uh, they, they put on quite a show for us. I mean, we have been extremely well taken care of throughout this visit. But I, I'd, I'd say the ultimate was when they had all the dishes do their dance for us. And so mm. I was, you know, video getting a video with my little still camera, mm. and I hear all this squealing to the side, and I had to pan right over, and there, <laughs> there she was. I'm telling you, jumping up and down. Those things move really fast. They... Fast and beautifully. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really impressive, and and it was not. It was really nice of them to move them around specifically for us. Usually, you visit a radio in a frometer, and they can't do that. They're doing work. They're doing testing. They're mm -hmm. doing, um, they're doing observations, and so I, I. I did a brief stint as a VLA tour guide, and people would ask all the time, oh, can they make it move? No, no, unless you're lucky, and they're doing a lot of calibration scans. You just kind of have to wait for it. But yeah, we got a beautiful view, um, beautiful slew. <laughs> I think that's the technical term for moving the antennas around together. And this really, I, I said this to you on the bus, this mm -hmm. was takes a big, big... Uh, I don't know, you put a big X next to one of your bucket lists. Oh, yes, items, yes. Right? I still have a few more radio telescopes to go, but yeah. this one, this was a big one, and this is one of the harder ones to get to. 
So I'm, I'm really thankful to, to John Stoke, who's over there on his cell phone at a radio observatory. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> One of our hosts here. And our host We're staff. hidden from the antennas, so it's okay, which is why I am on Wi-Fi right now as well. Uh, but yeah, thanks to John Stoke and the NRAO for, for having us out here. This is just an experience of a lifetime, so that's pretty cool. So you knew a lot of people up there, and you knew what was going on, too. You mm -hmm. had questions about uh, the correlator, mm -hmm. which is this truly amazing supercomputer yeah, that is. makes this kind of instrument possible. Right, right. Uh, and you were talking to, what was the name of the fellow? Alejandro, yeah. and I can't remember his last name, sorry. Um, he was in Charleston for a while. Saez? It starts with an S. S-A-E-Z. Saez. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Help from off camera You're from next. Allison Peck, <laughs> who will be joining her soon. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the correlator guys who worked a bit in mm -hmm. Charlottesville. And then I remember I was working in Charlottesville at the time. We had the sudden influx of Chilean engineers who were helping to put together the correlator, which they would then take back here uh, and set up. So I, yeah, I was curious about the architecture. It's 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 kind of there, there's a there's a kind of a change going on in correlator technology right now. It's the Alma correlator is kind of the last of I think it's going to be kind of the last of the big correlators where they actually use wires to connect everything and, um, you know, we've got the software correlator that is being used at the Very Long Baseline Array, uh, relying more on FPGA technology to kind of mix and match what you want to do, so. Not that I know what that is. Okay, Field Programmable Gate Array. You need to call me out when I use my okay. target. They're commercially available chips and you can actually program a correlator, mm -hmm. which is pretty pretty spectacular. So, I don't know if we'll see any this physically monstrous in the future, um, but who knows what's going to come down. Yeah, yep. who knows. 137 million processors. Yes. I'd like to know how many individual chips that Yes, exists. we'll have to find all 100. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we dealt with it. I mean, you were at, you actually didn't even have a jacket on toward the end there. I was, it was cold and windy. I, was really I left my jacket on the bus. But we had, do we have our oxygen cans here? I threw mine out because I'm pretty sure it's empty. Does I left mine on the bus. Anybody got their oxygen? Do you have your oxygen? Uh, no, I, I have Oh, okay. Hey, Tanya, yeah. do you have your oxygen can? Oh, you've got, no, you have a tank. You still have the I'll tank? Okay, so we're going to show what, what kind of what we had to put up with uh, to deal with the, the high altitude environment. So we were only there for a couple hours. Usually employees that are there have a big oxygen tank with a, a plug to their nose. We had these little guys, we were only there for a couple hours. This is, this is basically how we survive, and uh, <laughs> to varying degrees. Uh, and they do the trick. You yeah. actually do feel it. A couple of puffs, and yeah. you're getting real you get a too. Hit. You mm -hmm. get a little hit. You yeah. get a little hit of oxygen. You get brain working again. Seriously, the two of us were, could not remember the name of the movie, The Dish. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's the movie with the tarks, with the you know, sheep, one and Apollo. Apollo and... I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> yeah. so that was well, pretty fun. It was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, that's the highest I had ever been before this was a little more than 10,000 feet. Me too. A high country of Okay. So I'd say we did pretty well. I think, yeah, I mean, there were a few people who had some real difficulty. Right, and they, they ended up getting the nose tubes. Yeah. Um, before Allison runs away. Were you leaving? You'll be back? Okay. She's coming back. She'll okay. come back. Or if not, um, I am going to pretty much hang around the building to the rest of the afternoon. I'm going to forego the tours for you guys because, you know, I've I've seen I've seen antenna construction buildings before, so it's fine. Um, and try and get some interviews that we can post on YouTube later. Uh, getting the live thing going was was a challenge. So um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, want to come say hi? Yeah, come in. We have Here, one of the amazing scientists who worked on Alma uh, for many many years, lived in Santiago. <laughs> So this hi, is hi Allison. This is Allison Peck, who is with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. You now live in Charlottesville. You moved there what, like a month after I left, <laughs> something like that. Something like that. We just missed each other. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. After five years in Chile. Yeah. So I was down here working on the project for five years. I had the opportunity to come up to the telescope every other week, which stays fun, believe it or not, for awesome. many years. <laughs> awesome. So, um, what was your background uh, in astronomy that brought you to the ALMA project? Well, I did my PhD in physics, mm -hmm. and I was very interested in astronomy, obviously, but I was also interested in the tools of astronomy. How do you take the data? How do you, like, like the correlator you were talking about, I mean, it's very complicated instrumentation. I'm not an engineer. I don't build 
the yeah. instrumentation. But I found that one thing I can do is test the instrumentation. Okay. Yes. So that's what I came <laughs> down here. Um, I went first to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on the submillimeter array telescope, which is um, kind of similar to ALMA but much smaller. There are only eight antennas. Mm -hmm. They're only six meter diameter, but it does uh, sort of similar science. And so I worked there for uh, five years as well, testing all of the instruments, mm -hmm. and I just had a blast. It was so much fun. Nice. Just problem solving all the time. Yeah. And yeah. Trying to get the best data out of the telescope that you can. Mm -hmm. And so after five years of that, Sorry? they suggested I might enjoy doing the same thing at Alma on a much, much larger scale. It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I've been down here for five years, and it's, it's been a great time. So what kind of, what's the, the magnitude of capability? Uh, change in capabilities from SMA to ALMA. It's actually astounding and you know I don't want to say anything uh, bad about the SMA. I still have right. a it's tremendous past, amount it's, yeah, of loyalty. Finder. It still yeah. does good science. Right. But right. the change in sensitivity is enormous. Okay. <laughs> Some of the things that would take us maybe four nights in a row to mm -hmm. do at the submillimeter array, we can actually do in a couple of hours with Alma. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So wow. what that means, of course, is that we'll be able to do so many more science projects in the time that we have for observing. Okay. So it actually works to everybody's benefit. It's it's fast, we just we can collect the data, correlate it, send it out. Excellent. Excellent. It's been a huge jump. Now is this is this array being built in mind with the non radio astronomer astronomers in mind as well? Absolutely. That's another one of the big differences is that whenever you have an interferometer mm -hmm. rather than an optical telescope with a mirror and a camera and that sort of thing, um, it, there's a perception that it's going to be very difficult to use. To some extent, that perception is true because the techniques There's a are, very steep learning curve, but yes. once you get it, once you get it, you're then right. it's quite straightforward. Yeah. Exactly. So all you need to do is get a PhD. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you had me work. OK, you guys had me working on that when I was about to cry. Exactly. Exactly. No, it's, it's once Not you get well. the hang of it. Yeah. No, you did. You did. Yeah. You did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you. And, um, and I do think that that's a good opportunity for people. You know, right. There's no reason right. not to start if you're interested. Right. Um, and the software package that they have um, now, the CASA software package, is really great. I think. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's step quite up versatile. For <laughs> yes. I still love apes. But I love apes too. It's okay. <laughs> We're really dorking out. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we start talking about software, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, where were we? Before we were talking Before about software, we, we, we were talking job. about oh, using ALMA for non-radio For non-radio right. astronomer astronomers. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And so if people have a background in x-ray or optical or mm -hmm. that sort of thing, there are uh, there's a huge amount of things that they can do with ALMA. They can take data that complements the data they already have. So you're looking at different wavelengths, mm -hmm. which means that you're looking at different physical processes, which means that if you know, if you already know something about maybe very hot gas in a particular region of a particular galaxy, you can look and see what the cold gas is doing, how they're interacting, how mm -hmm. these things are, are working together to cause you know the, the galaxy to look like it does, to, mm -hmm. to behave like it does. Um, and so we want them to be able to use the telescope, even though there's a perception that it's very difficult to do. Right, right. And so in that sense, we've been working a lot more on the interface for the astronomers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have uh, what we call the observing tool that right. they use to create their proposals. And they can set the whole thing up without actually needing to know right. anything about the local oscillator frequency or, right. you know, they don't have to understand the correlator. Mm -hmm. They just put into this tool what they would like to do, what they would like their project to be, um, and then it's evaluated by a committee like all the other proposals, mm -hmm. and then we set it up for them and run it on the telescope. So mm -hmm. they don't have to visit, which in a way is a shame because some people yeah. would like to visit. But it means they don't have to visit, we run the project for them. Right. And then they get back calibrated data. Sure. Well, I'm I'm actually broadcasting live right now. If that doesn't scare you, <laughs> you can, have, can totally seat. have you come talk live. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can, you can <laughs> come take my seat because I'll be here. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared all these strong by telling you. We're online. Will be Evine Van <laughs> what, what is her name? Evine Van Dishoek. Evine Van Dishoek. Right. Thank you. She gave an excellent talk this morning at the oh, press conference. So She's very young. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now for the famous instructor. Okay, well, thank you, Allison Pex. Yes.
we're going to get some video later on, too. And so thank you. It's I good to see there. you. Yes, and we're exciting people now. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hi. Hi. So we are live on Google+. Plus. Um, oh, wow. I, my name is Nicole Gallucci. Hi. Hi. I'm Evie Vendisuk. Evie Vendisuk. Nice yes. to meet you. I'm an astronomer. Um, I work with a citizen science project called CosmoPlus. Oh. And um, so we, we do a lot of live hangouts on air. We talk to scientists, get, um, get them talking to people about their science. And it's interesting. So I thought I'd do a live hangout from Chile. Yeah. Why not? Oh, why so, not? <laughs> yes. um, you gave a really good talk about some of the um, science goals of ALMA within our Milky Way galaxy. Would you mind highlighting some of that for our audience? Sure. Uh, I think uh, ALMA will really tell us about uh, our origins, basically, yeah. the origins of the stars like our sun, planets like Earth and, right. and Jupiter. <laughs> and it's, it's very exciting that already with early ALMA, we're sort of seeing planet formation in action. Right, right, right. yeah. 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 That was so Those transitional discs you were yeah. talking about. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yes. Uh, um, you know, we, we sort of knew that they existed, and we had sort of these ends and fuzzy blobs, but, but now all of a sudden the sharpness of Alma is, is, yeah. is, is telling us so much about it. And that was early science with just 16, 16 antennas. antennas, yes, exactly. But we exactly. just saw 54, I it's, think, on site. And they said something like 57 or 57 on site? Yeah. No, not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> over many are connected, I don't know, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so. So you just can imagine the kind right. of images we're going to get compared right. with what I showed this morning. Yeah. Oh, and then of course the resolution is going to be improved once you go out to along the baseline. So. Absolutely, because uh, at the moment we're only seeing these largest holes on the transitional disks, but uh, because the baselines are only out to a few hundred meters, but uh, uh, in the next couple of years then it will go to a kilometer size, and then two right. kilometers, four kilometers, and then eventually 16 kilometers. Right, right. And then we're going to have an, uh, more than an order of magnitude improvement in our sharpness. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So now we're able to look sort of at the orbit of Neptune. Mm -hmm. Sort of where the holes uh, are, 30 astronomical units, um, and then uh, uh, once almost completed, we can zoom in to close to one astronomical okay. unit. Okay, wow. so really where the, 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 the treasure where we think the treasure planet is forming. Yes. Right, right, cool, very interesting. So we've got planet formation, uh, and then before that we have star formation. So yeah. we're seeing into these dark clouds, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. These dust obscured, these very molecular rich clouds, right? So there, is there? Um, um, I know almost seen uh, with spectral resolution that we've never had before. So can you like, tell us a little bit about the molecules you think will be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the other exciting part, yeah. especially for me as an astrochemist. You're an astrochemist, excellent. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the signals that most other of my colleagues throw away, I'm really interested oh, in. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because uh, what we see is that the star forming regions have such a rich chemistry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're able to, to find not just simple molecules like carbon monoxide, but really very complex right. organic molecules. Yeah. Hold on one sec. You want more people for us? What? Okay. Sure. Go, go. Yeah, I'll go as long as people want to chat. You may want to make sure you're still live. Oh, is it not? It's, I got it still. There you are. Mm, that, if that's and, network, and there's not much I can do. Got the same thing. Got the same frame. Losing the audio. <laughs> yeah. All right. It still says we're broadcasting. So sorry about this. We're <laughs> on the fly. It's a lot harder when you're on a Wi-Fi connection, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> okay, so if anyone is watching on the YouTube channel, I am watching your comments. Please say something <laughs> if we are still live. Uh, I have Tom and Kakambo, two of our regular viewers. So, hi. Uh, why did I mess up the window? I don't know what to do with the... Yeah, I'm still on Alma 2013. Um, is, it, is it still on you? It could be. I I'm could be sucking all the bandwidth. Third time. I should so. be sucking up all the bandwidth. I, hmm, does it still record even if it's not broadcasting? I doubt it. <sighs> no, I'm sorry. Does if it? You're... Yes, I doubt it. Yeah. Okay, because it's coming to you because it's broad. It's going right to YouTube and then it copies it from there. So I don't know. Oh, someone said we're still working. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank you, Kagambo. Okay, they see us. Douglas and Anthony. Hi, everyone. So the audio is fading a bit at times. So maybe we just, I didn't have my nice mic ready, so we just project at you guys. Um, okay, so sorry about that. That is the fun of a live show. Yes. Oh, okay, so we're talking about chemistry and yes. finding all these complex molecules. And you mentioned uh, 
simple amino acids. Is something uh, that you're looking for. Well, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Of, right. studies, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that is certainly one of the goals of Thalma. Right. Really, really, the molecules that are most closely connected with. Um, what we think life is made of. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, what we are already finding in the early ALMA data is simple sugars. Mm -hmm. uh, sugars near a forming star yeah. um, at exactly the right place, sort of the, the, the orbit of uh, Uranus. And you can see that these molecules are even moving inwards in mm -hmm. this planetary disk, protoplanetary disk. So it's it's already getting very exciting in the yeah. early ALMA. So. Yeah, I got to say, I was pretty, pretty blown away by the early science results because. <clears throat> You know, I, I I lived in Charlottesville for many years, mm -hmm. so hearing about Alma, yeah, you know, yeah, first yeah. antenna, yeah. And second yeah. antenna, yeah. you're like, okay, when's it gonna come? Yeah, yeah. 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 And now now it's here. <laughs> all of a sudden, it just blew up with yeah. the early science results. Yeah. it's really impressive. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm afraid I have to go. Great. Thank you so much. much. My yeah. pleasure. Thank and you. Good luck and enjoy the yeah. uh, day, and the Thank viewers you. also enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Sure. All right, we're gonna start moving. Yeah. You all should probably get an actual view of the desert behind me while we find people. This is really like, yeah, there's the desert. There's Matt. <laughs> there's some extinct volcanoes. <laughs> so, give you guys an idea of the view of what we're seeing out here. Oh, there we go. So, we're at 9,000 feet right now. Uh, in the desert, we passed uh, up to the high site at 16,000 feet. We went through the the layer of cacti, and then the layer of scrub, and then the layer of nothing, no plants. It's uh, pretty arid. Um, I think we've got some more people heading over, so I'll go back to my seat. <laughs> we don't get dizzy, don't get dizzy, don't get dizzy, don't get dizzy, don't get dizzy. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Does John explain to you what this is? This is live on Google Plus and YouTube. Um, uh, hi, your name is? Stuart Corder. Stuart Corder. And you, what do you do? I am the head of the Science Commissioning. Head of Science Commissioning. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Nicole. I'm, <laughs> I'm a, yeah, jack of all trades. <laughs> So what is what is your, your responsibility with Alma? Okay, so and do you mind projecting a little bit? I no, don't have a very good mic. I'm no, sorry. The, so basically, the other teams deliver aspects of the uh, components of the system mm -hmm. to the system integration group, and they put it all together into an antenna with everything in it, and then we integrate it into the the full array and, and verify the science performance. Oh, okay. So we actually do the the. You know, observations of previously observed sources to make sure that they look like we expect. We verify that you know, all the, the uh, performance of the, the frequency structures and all these things are, are as expected for mm -hmm. all of the, uh, the, the different science modes. So like, right now we're working on verifying how well we can do polarization measurements. Oh, okay, yeah. They said they were working on that down into 2013, getting polarization. Now. Yeah, so yeah. now we're, we're, we're taking little steps. We're starting with polarization of small things mm -hmm. near the center of the, uh, the antenna field. Okay. And then we'll move out to bigger things, and then we'll worry about frequency-dependent polarization effects. and uh, uh, uh. So, <laughs> so my team does say. that uh, that sort of last uh, checkout before. So we're sort of the thing that stands in between the community being able to apply to do science observations with it and the, the engineering side. Well, on the other hand, I see you as uh, making sure that the scientists are going to get the kind of performance right. that they well, want. Yeah, so that's, you're not really, that's the other side of the you're making it happen. Right. The, the, uh, so yeah, it depends on who you ask. I mean, we're either, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I try to be an optimist. No, I mean, yeah, definitely we, we spend most of our time making sure that things are working well enough so that when scientists get the data, they don't spend most of their time thinking, what is that? What is what that? Is Why is that there? So. There's some pretty stringent requirements on the various parts of Alma. There's pointing, there's the frequency accuracy. Yeah. Well, they go all the way down. I mean, you've got yeah. some requirements on uh, the, the faintest line that you can detect next to a bright line, mm -hmm. the requirements on uh, whether or not you can actually obtain certain noise levels in the image by integrating forever. How well does that integrate down as expected? Right. Um, how fine a structure you can see, and then everything flows down from that. I mean, you have, well, okay, if I if I want to have a certain accuracy in the final image, then the pointing has to be so good, otherwise the pointing will screw up the accuracy. Mm -hmm. So then you go down from that, well, what do you have to do in order to make the pointing that good? There are other sort of lower level engineering requirements. So it's, uh, yeah, there's, for, there's very many requirements going all the way from yeah. the top science performance all the way down to the fundamental 
aspects of the right. imagery. Part of what goes into a proposal is the scientists have to be able to show that given how Alma performs, that they can actually get done what right. they want to get exactly. done. Right, and so yeah, they kind of rely on that. Has there been any one particular subsystem that um, was particularly challenging or un or surprising? Well, I mean, the the real trouble, as as always in these kind of systems, is is not the individual subsystems themselves. Is what happens when you plug them oh, all in together? Because yeah. there's a, there not only is the requirements on the specifications of the of the individual components, there's a lot of requirements on interface documents. So, right. you know, how does this component talk to this component? Right. And it turns out that as hard as you try, there's always a few things that are left out. Yeah. And given the infinite possibilities for doing things, sometimes when you plug them together, they don't work quite as well as you would have expected them to. Right. And it's usually figuring out the, you know, the dirty details of uh, this one system expects you know, a signal to be in this way, and this other system is providing it in this way. And it's not necessarily wrong with respect to the, right. the interface document, but there's some wiggle room there, and then you have to refine those those issues. And that, that's where most of our problem. Where it comes together, because you have you have a team working on each subsystem, right. but then when they bring it together, there's a lot of people right. and a complicated system. Right. And by the time it gets to us and the and the and the people that do the individual mm -hmm. antenna integration, it's past most of the uh, the verifications of the lower level specifications. So the only thing really left for us, you know, is to plug it all together and make sure it works. Yes. And, and we you know that's our part of it. So yeah. it, it, for me, that's that's the challenge. And that's, cool. Uh, it's cool. expected. So, what is your um, what is your what, your background? What got you into what what led you to Alma? <laughs> yeah, well, I actually was one of the uh, the grad students that was in charge of commissioning the combined array for research in millimeter astronomy. Okay. So the so Karma array in Central California. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, when I was a student, my thesis advisor said, "Well, I'm interested in you going up and helping with the commissioning for up to half the time." Current NRAO director was the project manager at the time. For uh -huh. Karma said, "Well, we oh, want somebody. Right. We want somebody to come up, but we don't want him to come up for any less than half the time." So I spent yeah. half my life at, uh, at Karma for about a year and a half or two, okay. and uh, so I got really interested in this phase of the project. And uh, you know, it's very exciting. Different problems are coming up every day. <laughs> Something that you fixed a week ago may become unfixed because some you know connector breaks or somebody checks in a change to software and model. So it's yeah. very it's a very dynamic situation and you get right. kind of addicted to that. You know, something's gotta be happening critically every day. And uh, so I came down here again at the uh, sort of uh, suggestion of, of, of Tony Beasley and um, was a postdoc down here for two years and then I was staff for a year and then I came back to Charlottesville uh, to the home office for about seven months and then returned down here as the, okay. uh, as the lead. So you live in, do you live, live here or do you live in Charlotte? I live in Santiago. You live in Santiago, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And I've been here for, since late 2008 with the exception of uh, seven months. Seven in, months in Charlotte. Uh, in the early part of last year. Okay. Okay. That, okay. I lived in Charlottesville for seven years, but I left about a year ago, so that might would explain. No, we, <laughs> we missed each other. Completely missed each other. I, think. Oh, I apparently left just as Alma was ramping up in Charlottesville. Because <laughs> well, I mean, Allison yeah. showed up, too. No, I mean, yeah, things are getting really exciting. It on, is, on, yeah. On all the fronts. I mean, we're ramping down, supposedly, with the construction, but we still have quite a bit left to do. Still quite a few antennas that, yeah. I mean, they're, they're here. They they're just here. need to Everything's get up here. there. <laughs> I mean, for us, it's a, we're trying to balance the, you know, getting things to be robust and, and, right. and uh, and not have you know have high efficiency, but there's still some capabilities that have yet to be delivered, and so we're trying to match uh, what the community wants versus what we can provide, right. and, uh, and so that's sort of what we've been focusing on the last couple of months. Cool, cool, very cool. Uh, what's been your favorite part about working on it? Oh. I've been, you mentioned the problem solving. <sighs> I mean the uh, I mean I, I like getting involved in the, in the software and so when I was a, a postdoc we there were some uh, some tools that were sort of written for the high level of final operation of the array okay. but there weren't a lot of tools that were optimized for commissioning processes and so okay. with a couple of other guys down here we sort of took it upon ourselves to sort of start developing some of those tools and so that was really exciting and I mean really the other the other aspect that I that I really Enjoy is not you know I, I love the problem solving but I also really appreciate the science that Alma is going to offer mm. and even if I don't get to a lot to do a lot of it myself because yes. I'm not I'm not writing a lot of proposals just knowing you know seeing the results coming out and be like yeah, we we like really made this happen we made that happen without without your job so I my background was also in instrumentation in an astronomy program so yeah 
if you don't have it put together well, yeah. and you don't have the people that are calibrating and checking and doing all that, then you, yeah, you don't have any science. Yeah. So that's, that's I so, think it's the most important part, but I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I mean, it's, uh, you, know, you have to have all the, all the links in the chat. Yes, but, uh, that's right. you got to have really, everything. You know, with the with doing the science end, you really sit and focus on one problem for an extraordinarily long time, and I enjoy doing that. But uh, you know, it's it's really the, the dynamic, different sort of things every day that yeah. really gets me going. Good. So, uh, thank you. Cool. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting meeting with you and hearing from you. Um, so this will be posted on YouTube. I'm gonna try and send a link around to everyone who's been on been on it so you can check it out. Okay. Hopefully the audio is coming fine. Right, okay. guys? Bye. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Come join. Thank you. You know what I want to talk to you about? What? Um, the oh. fact that an event like this can happen mm -hmm. and an instrument that is this spectacular mm -hmm. um, and does it get the attention that it deserves in, in terms of the knowledge that it's making available to you know? Yeah. I don't think so. No. Um, but also some of that for me is the way that I say this as a, you know, a press today. Look mm -hmm. at that. I'm press. How weird is that? Um, but there's a, there's a lot. Um, the way that science works and the way that it's reported, mm -hmm. there's kind of a disconnect. Sure. And so when people reading the news are looking for the big story, the big story, the big story, what's the new thing, the new thing, when really it's this process, gradual process of discovery. And it's going, you know, this instrument's going to be, they said this morning, they're going to be around, it's going to be in operation for 30 years. Yeah. So 30 years of science, I don't think it's getting the kind of, um, my mind just went blank again, the kind of attention that it's We're still <laughs> oxygen deprived, yeah. so you have a good excuse. Okay, thank you. So what I think of about is, you look at the, the Hang on, a windstorm is, is picking huge, up. Uh, dust storm oh God! Away, I guess. <laughs> just got dust in my eye. <laughs> Here. Oh no! Oh, it's just a gust that came out of nowhere, and it just now I think it's going away. Live TV, everyone. So <laughs> we all know that last August, Curiosity landed on Mars, right? And the world was well, the world celebrated, right? absolutely. But that wasn't in itself oh, science. Like it was a tremendous accomplishment, mm -hmm. but the science came afterward. Mm -hmm. In fact, Curiosity right. is just really just getting starting. into doing its real science. Right. And so now it's kind of, to a degree, except it's still a rover on Mars, it's kind of in the same boat as so much of what else goes on. It is reassuring. It's um, nice to see right. how many media come for an event here in the middle of nowhere, yes. beautiful nowhere, yes. but not the easiest place to get to. Right. And maybe we're on the right track. We're getting there. We're getting there. Personally, I think radio astronomy deserves a lot more attention. But again, that's my bias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come in and? Yeah, have, grab my chair. Oh, cool. You, would you like to? Reckon? Oh, you. you can. You know okay. each other, right? right. <laughs> I met him once. Oh, okay, well, let's turn this around. Like no. Here, come on over here. Why don't I just sit off screen? No. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you're watching, you can leave a comment on the YouTube channel. Because this was last minute, that's the only stream I'm watching. So, so yeah, check that out. Uh, so I am here with Tony Beasley, who is the director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. How excited are you to see this inauguration happen? I'm very excited by this. I mean, uh, not only uh, is it a, a remarkable event for, uh, for the national uh, effort in astronomy, but I was also a project manager here for mm -hmm. four years, uh, a couple of years ago. So I put a lot of my own uh, blood, sweat, and tears into this project. So I'm, I'm very glad to, to see it uh, such a success and, and to actually have this day where we're opening the telescope. What was your job like as project manager? What were the kind of um, challenges you had to deal with in, during construction? Um, the, the point where I joined the project, uh, you know, we were starting to do a lot of site construction here. And so, for example, you know, the contract on the building that we're sitting in here, that was one of the, the big uh, big things I worked on at the time. The contracts for the antennas. So there was a lot of the big construction starting up, and a lot of the very major uh, contracts were, were just coming, uh, coming into focus. And so, you know, I worked a lot on that. We had a lot of partnership issues back in those days in terms of the the different uh, executives learning how to work together to build this international project. That was exciting. Um, but we got past all of that and uh, a, a big part of it was uh, actually finally securing all the money that was needed to build the project. Right. And so you know, now that we're down to really the last six months of the construction project and we 
you know, look like we're going to actually get the thing built for about the right amount of money. It's uh, it's very, very good. That's I good. feel very good about it. That's good. Mm. Cool. Um, so what's what science results are you most looking forward to? Do you have a favorite? Um, well, some of the stuff that's been produced already is very exciting. Some of the uh, some of the gas flowing through protoplanetary disk stuff. I yeah. mean, it's not actually something I personally work on, but I think it's exactly the kind of stuff that that Alma was built to do. So you know, there were originally um, some some major science goals uh, with Alma. There were three primary science goals. Um, one was to, to look at a high redshift galaxy, one was to look at a protoplanetary disk, and another one was to, to look at a normal Milky Way galaxy. And All of those observations are being done. So yeah. I'm just kind of excited by the fact that uh, after all of the effort and uh, you know all of the money, we're actually producing the instrument that we said we would. And so I think that's a, it's a tribute to all the people that worked on the yeah. project. And it's also, um, it shows that as a community we can make a nice commitment to do something important and actually achieve it. That is a good. That is a really good thing to message to put out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, so, what is your? I've been asking people what their background is. What's your background? Uh, what brought you all the way here to Alma and Monterey? Mm. Um, so, my background was in astronomy. Uh, right from when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an astronomer. And uh, you're that kid. <laughs> so, so I was very lucky along the way that uh, you know. Uh, um, I managed to get to university and do okay and sort of keep, keep moving with it and then in about uh, 1991 I had an opportunity to go to the VLA in New mm -hmm. Mexico as a, as a postdoc after I'd finished my PhD and sort of stayed and sort of moved from one job to the next and uh, I was very lucky I think that all the way along I had very good people advising me and I just by sheer fortune managed to be in the right place at the right time several times. And so. That's good. Well, astro radio astronomy is kind of a nice, tight-knit community, so mm. there's, there's a lot of good stuff there. too tight-knit sometimes. <laughs> it's a separate issue. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Um, so do you think there are any, uh, you mentioned the international collaborations, are there lessons that other big projects can learn from what you guys did early on, getting that collaboration going? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, there were a couple of different rounds of, of defining ALMA's international collaboration. I mean, there were the early ideas in the sort of the late 90s about how it would all come together. Then there was another attempt when the first definition of the project was put together. Mm -hmm. And then there was sort of what we eventually evolved to, which is the current structure of the way the international partnership operates. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons learned. I mean, overall, the... Uh, the lesson, you know, a big lesson to learn, which I don't think many people would have believed at the beginning, is that there really is a, a cost associated with an international partnership. I mean, you know, if, if you and I decide we're going to build a car and I bring the wheels and you bring the car, well, we kind of could naively think that just bolting them together achieves the car. But in practice, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the details, sort of funding and technical and uh, social aspects of you and I working together um, really could, can sort of contribute to the, the scope and the, and the cost of the project. And so I don't think that was really appreciated, how difficult actually operating with different countries, different funding cycles and all that would be. So I think, you know, when we think of some of these international projects that are being thought about now, um, it's something to, to factor in. Is that yeah. It's easy to get a group of four people in a room to agree on how much something would cost, but when you actually try and take people from four different countries to build that thing, it's going to be harder than, than you think. So, so that's a, that was a hard lesson learned, I think, by Alma. And I think yeah, when we look at some of the other projects out there, like the Square Kilometre Array and so on, they're, um, I think they're aware of the lesson. Whether they learn the lesson is a different thing. Well, I think a, a background in science doesn't necessarily prepare you for those aspects, right? In grad school, I just got my PhD a little less than a year ago. You, you focus on research and science, not so much on that, uh, this, like you said, the social and financial aspects. Sure. So that's something you kind of learn on the job. Yeah, it is. So, the, I mean, it, there is kind of the, there's a there's a fork in the road you get to, which is, you know, if you study to become a professional astronomer, and a lot of people go into um, kind of the academic side of it, so university and the professor thing. And then there are the people that go work at the observatories. I think the people that go work to the observatories, you know, they're more used to kind of that um, funding project kind of lifestyle. Right. But even then, it's not the same as building a you know, $1.3 billion telescope. And so, yeah, <laughs> it is the case that, uh, you know, there's a, a nascent field of science management maybe yeah, that, uh, yeah. um, 
there's probably people out there who study it. There are probably people with PhDs in it, but we don't have a lot of those people. Right, uh, right. We tend to science communication is kind of similar. It's just is that right? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, there's a particular um, spin. I think. I think managing a science project is different to managing building a strip mall. Right? You know, yeah. if you if you're building a strip mall, well, you've probably built others, and you can probably guess within a few percent how long all the different tasks take. Right. When you're building a telescope like Alma, there are parts of it, there are boxes that have never been built before, and there are parts of the telescope that have never existed on this planet. And so there's an R and D component to it that it's hard to predict. And so inserting these random elements into your very normal project plan can be challenging. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is something. Thank you so much, Tony, for, for joining. You're welcome, yeah. and uh, enjoy the visit. I will. I, I'm blown away. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, okay. I want to see if I can flag down anybody else if they can. Yeah, I know. A lot of people in there. Uh, so it sounds like we're getting a bit of wind noise. Sorry. Yeah. Could bring it inside at some point, but um, I think we've been running for a little while. I'm going to sign off. Um, I have barely touched my lunch because I wanted to bring you guys some live interviews. And I promised you all a hangout, so here's a hangout. <laughs> um, yeah, got somebody? Do I? Yes. Time has come. Okay, time has come for me to take a tour. So I will get lots of video and post it later. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.